Well, welcome everybody. We have several presenters today for this webinar where we will focus on family strengthening programming in the times of COVID-19. We have two colleagues from War Child Holland, Lebanon, who will be presenting on the caregiver support intervention that they've uh, adapted in the past few months. They will share their uh, experiences and their successes and their challenges. Sarah Homo from Save the Children will give a short presentation uh, as well. Then we also have Kellen from Tushinda who will give us an update in regards to their COVID-19 adaptation of their programming, uh, which will be a follow-up actually from the presentation they gave in the previous webinar. Thank you, everyone. Apologies, this, this reorder might be a bit confusing. Our original schedule had uh, War Child Holland giving the main presentation, followed by a very short uh, programmatic example by Save the Children, then to be followed by an update from Tushinda on the presentation they provided on the last webinar in, at the end of April. Obviously, due to real-time technology issues, we will reorder our presentations. So my apologies, this is a very short example of one specific programmatic adaptation that we've seen a lot of success with um, at Save the Children over, over the last three months or so. And it is certainly just one example. It is not intended to be a comprehensive overview of everything that Save the Children is doing to support family strengthening during COVID-19 adaptation. That is a long and exhaustive list. Um, and a lot of what we are doing overlaps significantly with things that you will hear from the other presenters today, including Tushinda and uh, War Child Holland. Okay, one of the key psychosocial support programs that Save the Children implements globally is called HEART. And this stands for Healing and Education Through the Arts. It is a structured expressive arts program that uses expressive arts activities to help children to process thoughts and feelings and experiences and to prompt discussion that happens in group settings where a trained adult facilitator along with a group of children go through an expressive arts process together and then go through a supportive sharing circle where they share their artwork or they share the stories behind their artwork and their thoughts and feelings and experiences with each other. And this, this is something that we do globally in classrooms, in child-friendly spaces, in youth centers and community centers uh, in uh, about 35 countries around the world. And what we have found very interesting during COVID-19 adaptation processes is the way that we've been able to adjust and adapt certain components of this program to the COVID-19 context. So here are a few very quick examples of that. The first is that we have, in many countries, we are distributing psychosocial support kits. And these are kits that are distributed to the household to support children with activities that they can do at home. These include books, toys, arts, supplies, sometimes home uh, creative learning and, and home education activities and guidance for caregivers. And the guidance for caregivers varies from context to context. In some cases, we have included positive parenting messaging. In some cases, we have included um, simple activities for parents to do at home with children to help them to engage in discussions about the current situation related to COVID-19 and to share their thoughts and feelings and experiences and to be supportive and reflective, uh, good listeners with their children in, in such a, a creative expression environment. And so this guidance is how, along with the art supplies is helping parents and children, caregivers and children to do heart activities in their home. One example of this is something that we call stress busters, which are very specific activities where we essentially do very short either music-based activities or dramatic play-based activities to help children to calm down and to process stress in a very short and easy and playful way. And we have done printouts of our stress busters. We have shared them through social media. 
We have also in several countries facilitated them over radio as part of interactive radio instruction so that children and caregivers can listen along at home and follow along with the activities. The third example is additional activities that we're able to do at home that we have written up and included in the family support distributions, whether these are larger distributions that include health and hygiene supplies, or whether these are specifically the psychosocial support kits. But these are essentially one page write up of uh, very simple arts, expressive arts activities that caregivers and children can do together at home. And by providing both the write up, the instructions of the activities, sometimes with illustrations, as well as the actual supplies, it allows the caregivers and the children to together do these activities in the home environment. And the fourth adaptation is that we have adapted the programming to be able to have remote training. Normally the training protocol for this program includes a four to five day in-person introductory training, followed by a two day refresher training several months later for the local facilitators. Because we are no longer able to have the global Save the Children team travel, to conduct these trainings. We have designed a remote video training that is conducted over the course of two days and essentially contains a condensed version of the program. So that in cases where physical distancing related to COVID-19 is still allowing children to gather in child-friendly spaces, or in community groups, we are able to train the facilitators of those groups to be able to integrate hard activities um, into those spaces and specifically hard activities that are able to address some of the concerns related to COVID-19. And we'll uh, give a few examples of that now. Okay, so here is um, the cover illustration of our stress busters. And here are, is some of the content from inside the stress busters pamphlet. This first one is a relaxation activity based on dramatic play where children pretend that they are holding a flower in one hand and a candle in the other. Essentially, it, it promotes breathing. The one immediately after that was two different examples of physical t muscle tense and release relaxation activities. And that was in Welsh, which was translated for a UK-based distribution, family support distribution. And this third one that we're looking at now, Feather Statue, again, this is a, a muscle tense and release, relaxation, dramatic play activity that's very simple and very easy and something that caregivers and children can do at home or CFS facilitators can do with children in physically distanced child-friendly space settings. Okay, and here we have a screenshot of one of our remote trainings. This was specifically with the DRC Benny office where physical distancing guidelines are still allowing group uh, gatherings and group trainings. And so this is one of our remote global heart trainers, Phoebe Morabi, conducting a remote training with the team in DRC. This is from the same training. And what you can see, this is our other colleague, uh, Daria Lipovats, also co-facilitating that training with Phoebe. And as you can see in the background, we have an example of one of the activities, which is specifically customized to COVID-19 times. It's an activity where children and caregivers or children and CFS facilitators artistically create a fun and creative mask. And then they have a discussion about how masks can be fun. And they also have a discussion about how sometimes masks are necessary to help protect us for example, in a health-related uh, situation such as COVID-19. And this allows a very gentle transition into a conversation about wearing masks or seeing other people wearing masks related to a health concern. We now have the very last thing that we have to share here is an audio clip from the Save the Children Uganda office, which, which is an example of the interactive radio instruction facilitation of one of the stress busters. It's a very quick 30 second audio clip if that is working. Welcome to another episode of Stress Busters, brought to you by Save the Children Uganda in collaboration with Burke's Sabiti Foundation. 
Hello everyone, my name is Agnes from Save the Children. I am back to show you some more really simple activities which we can all do to stay healthy while at home during this corona time. I can tell you that my body feels very stiff when I stay home all day and I'm sure you does too. So today we are going to do some stretching of our muscles again. Yay! Yay! Okay, this game is called the lemon. Pretend there is a lemon tree in your room full of very juicy lemons. Mm. Stretch and reach up into the tree and pick a lemon with each hand. Pick lemon, pick lemon. Now squeeze the lemon as hard as you can to get the juice out. Squeeze and squeeze until all is out. When all the juice is out, throw the lemon on the floor. Don't just drop it, throw it. Throw it with a bang. Now relax your hands and then do it again a few times until you've squeezed enough juice for you to drink. When you are done, Give your hands a good shake to get rid of the juice. Both hands at once. Shake, shake. Shake once more. Okay. Did you enjoy this game? I did. I will be back tomorrow with another fun activity. Please remember to wash your hands, keep a distance from other people, and take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Join us next time for another exciting episode of Stress Busters. This message was brought to you by Save the Children Uganda in collaboration with Burke's Sabiti Foundation. Thank you very much. Again, a lot of these adaptations to this one specific model are really about the logistics. It's making the introductory training remote by video link. It is making some of the activities accessible to the home environment by printing out instructions for caregivers and providing the supplies needed to engage in the activities at home and it's providing interactive radio instruction so that children and caregivers can listen along on their radio and participate together in the home environment. We will provide some links to the online resources so that anyone who's interested can see the full Stress Buster pamphlet. We have it available in multiple languages. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah, for that uh, presentation. So Mariana and Fadila, can you quickly introduce yourself and then uh, yes. get the way? So hello again, my name is Fadila. I work with World Child in the north of Lebanon and I'm the research implementation coordinator for the caregiver support intervention. Today, my colleague Marianne and I will be presenting how we adapted the caregiver support intervention during COVID-19. So basically, our presentation will be divided into two parts. I will be leading the first part that mainly gives you a general understanding about this, the caregiver support intervention. Then Marianne will, will be explaining in details how we adapted the program during the lockdown. Okay, so let's start first uh, by sharing the two main focus of the caregiver support interventions. The first main focus of the CSI is to strengthen parenting indirectly by reducing parental stress and improving parental well-being. And the second focus is to strengthen parenting directly through training and positive parenting. We can explain more about the rationale behind this focus. So for 25 years, research and practices with war-affected children focused on effects of direct war exposure, which showed limited direct effects or even mixed and modest effects of limited duration. Harsh parenting also predicts trauma symptoms among conflict-affected children, at least as strongly as exposure to armed conflict. The traditional parenting programs usually emphasize on parenting, while our focus in the CSI or in the caregiver support intervention is that even under conditions of distress, parents will be able to make use of existing and newly acquired knowledge and skills. Therefore, the ultimate goal of the caregiver support intervention is to promote the resilience and well-being of children by promoting the well-being and positive parenting of their parents or other primary caregivers. 
we can see the underlying model that summarizes what I just shared with you. During times of war, and when living as refugees, adults and children are confronted with very difficult circumstances that, that are directly affecting their well-being. And in the midst of all this, caregivers must still raise their children. The fact that parents cannot always fulfill their roles of providers and protectors for the family often leads to also affect the parental well-being which affect their ability to parent and at the end affect also the child mental health and psychosocial well-being. So basically the caregiver support intervention is a brief of nine sessions. It's a psychosocial intervention for parents affected by war and forced migration. It's aimed at mothers and fathers and it's usually implemented by trained community members who are very well trained on how to be empathetic, non-judgmental, able to normalize, and to be supportive and respectful. As for the methods in the next slide that we focus on to reach our goal that we already shared with you, we usually use to reach our first goal, the social support of group. We use also the coping skills for anxiety and stress and some coping strategies and triggers about anger and frustration in addition also to the weekly home practice and mindfulness, self-calming and relaxation exercise. And to reach our second goal, we usually help the caregivers to recognize the impact of stress on parenting and on kids, in addition to sharing with them some key elements of effective parenting, like early childhood development, influence of fathers, positive parent-child interactions and non-violent methods of discipline, in addition also to home practice of parenting techniques. Now, we will be moving with Marianne to the next part of our presentation. Hello, everyone. So my name is Marianne, and I'm the psychosocial support coordinator, and I work for World Child Lebanon. In Lebanon, 21st of February, Corona knocked our doors. The lockdown started 15th of March. Both were new additional stressors added to a very long list of stressors that the caregivers are dealing with, and especially the unprivileged community. And these stressors are due to many factors such as socioeconomic, politics, etc. All our face-to-face -face activities were stopped. In order to tailor our response to the new challenging situation, we have done an assessment with caregivers, youth, and the children in order to understand better their needs and to know more about the preferred modality to communicate with them. As you know, such a rapid needs assessment is a requirement to make our humanitarian response principle. In this assessment, most of the caregivers expressed that they are very stressed and they're not able to deal with the uncomfortable feelings nor with their children during this situation. And as per the caregivers, their preferred modalities were sending them audio messages through WhatsApp that does not require a lot of data consumption. And based on these facts, we find that the caregiver support intervention responds to the needs that they were mentioning and they were talking about. We tried to focus on topics that they were relevant for them. This is why we chose seven topics from the caregiver support intervention that we've turned them to remote uh, work. These topics were, what is the stress and how to deal with? And mainly when I say how to deal with, we were providing or we were working on providing caregivers with all the coping techniques that they can use and mainly the coping techniques in the, in the care, caregiver support intervention were meditation techniques. So I'm talking here about relaxation exercises. And we usually start by focusing on the breathing exercises first. As for the, the second topic, we worked on adapting the thinking too much topic in order for them to understand what is the thinking too much and how to deal with 
And also with this topic, we provided them with relaxation techniques as well as the topic of anger and frustration and how to deal with. They were really in need to know more about their children's stress and how to deal with this stress. And me as a caregiver, what I should do? What are the symptoms? What are the indica indicators that my child is in stress? In addition to effective discipline techniques, because as they mentioned, they were really in need for positive techniques in order to help them deal better with their children, especially that they are with them all day in, in, the, in the house. In addition to activities and games that both caregivers and children can do together. So in this slide, I'm going to focus more on how we did the adaptation and on what we took into consideration in order to adapt and in order to this adaptation be practical for, for the caregivers. But what I wanted to mention first, that some of the caregivers wa was able to receive WhatsApp audios and the rest of caregivers, they were really not able to do so. This is why we provided them with DVD receiver. So what we were focusing on, we focus on key elements. We need that our recordings are quick and straightforward messages. They don't even have the will or the time, if I want to say, to spend a lot of time just listening to an audio. They want very effective tips. The second point that we took into consideration that we really wanted to choose the topics that are relevant for them in this situation and in this context. We tried to choose very simple language. In the caregiver support manual, as you know, it is designed to be done face to face. So it contains some technical words, sometimes long, long messages. This is why we try to adapt these messages into a very simple one in order to make sure that the information will be understandable from everyone, especially that we're not dealing with them face to face. They're going to listen to this recording by their own. We also focus that the duration of every recording do not exceed three minutes. Making the recordings should be appealing and relaxing. This is why we choose a person from the team who has to record and has a very relaxing voice so that the caregiver, when listening to her, it would not be bothering them. And another important point for us was the follow-up with the caregiver. As you know, if we only, it's, it's not only about delivering the message and that's it. It is about following up on daily basis with caregivers. This is why caregivers were all put on WhatsApp groups, very small WhatsApp group, uh, 10 to 12 caregivers on each WhatsApp group. And there's always a session of question and answer and follow up after we send the, the audio. And as you know, since we're not face to face again with caregivers, some of them might be on a very high level of distress and some of them might not be even telling this us or privately or in the group. This is why we made sure that the caregivers should be provided by a helpline. And this helpline, we have a national helpline in Lebanon, which is the National Emotional Support and Suicide Prevention. And at the end of every recording, we mentioned this helpline for the caregivers. Here I will talk a little bit about, about the structure of this remote session or this remote version of caregiver support intervention. So every topic was divided into two recordings. Therefore, we have a total of seven topics and 15 recordings. In addition to all the relaxation exercises that are specific for every topic. And as I've mentioned before, at the end of every recorded, recording, we made sure to remind the caregivers that in case they were not able to deal with their uncomfortable feelings, or if they are in a very high level of distress, 
to ask for support. And we really emphasize on the fact that this is their right not to be okay, but they should ask for support. And this is where we mention the National Health Plan. I will be talking a little bit now about the modality of implementation. A guidance note was, a, was developed in order, of course, to specify the modality of intervention and to make things clear because War Child do not do the, the implementation herself. We do the implementation through partners. This is why we, may, we made sure that everything is clear. After this guidance, we also made sure that the community facilitators who already implemented face-to-face -face CSI were, were responsible for the follow-up with caregivers them, themselves. A very detailed induction on the new version was made online with them. After taking the consent of the caregivers, they were added into a small group of WhatsApp. A clear introduction with a clear objective was made in order not to have very high expectations from what we're going to deliver. One topic was provided every week, so I mean two recordings with specific dates. The space for asking questions was open for every session, and the caregivers were also asked to give their feedback at the mid and by the end of the cycle of the 15 recordings, if I want to mention. To uh, say it is a cycle. For us, the most important part is the feedback from the caregivers and the interaction they made with us. Most of them were showing interest and they were involved in listening and practicing the coping exercises. What was really recognizable that the number of dropouts from the WhatsApp group was very minimal. Caregivers reported that the topics was very relevant and helpful for them. It's interesting for me to end up from a quote that a caregiver shared with us. She sent us an audio message saying, I felt like the girl who recorded these audios is living with me. She's describing things that are happening with me. I will be waiting for the coping skills that she will be providing me with. That was from Fadila's and my side. Thank you. I'm Kellen uh, from Tushinda Children's Trust. I'm a social worker. And uh, Tushinda is a non-profit organization that works in Mazare and Kambiu slums, informal, uh, known as informal settlements in Kenya, focusing on family strengthening in relation to uh, child protection. We are grateful to be given another chance to update you briefly on what's going on from the last update we gave. So what we are doing in response to COVID-19, from what has changed since uh, my previous update is, we are doing monthly survey of uh, 127 families to know how if they are able to access their work or they can access food. From the survey that we have conducted, we have been able to distribute two mass uh, food distribution to beneficiaries, those who are incapable of getting food or they have lost their jobs and they're not able to provide for their families. Initially, from my last update, our CHVs were doing home visit, but due to the massive increase of COVID-19 cases in Mathare, we have suspended CHV home visits and encouraged them to do regular phone check-ins. Also, knowing that the rates of child protection concern will rise, we have tried to focus on the voice of the child in remote work. This is by social workers asking to speak directly to the children while they are doing their regular phone check-ins, and this is continuous. Also, we have been uh, working in handy with uh, the mentors. We have requested them to work with the girls. These are the teen mentors to do regular check-ins also with the girls, especially now that the rates of teenage pregnancy in Kenya are very high. This is just for the mentors to share information with the mentees, also provide guidance, motivation, and also provide uh, emotional support, being their role models. We are also considering this and uh, with the boys, so this process is also to be taken through the same with the boys. We have CHVs who have been doing regular check-ins to school children just to know their progress on remote schoolwork. With this, we do referrals to counselors 
from the social workers, from the community health volunteers, and also to the mentors, just to have the emotional uh, support from our counselor and to be free and talk to them, just to be stable enough health-wise or in the well-being. We have done a couple of actions in response to the feedback that you're getting from the girls. We have distributed a total of 53 sanitary napkins and also provided food packages to these families. Also, we have allocated funds to support children, school supply for remote learning. This is uh, right now they're not getting notebooks and pencils. That's why I come in as Tushinde and uh, we give necessary support. Also, we have uh, reallocated new funding from funders to support COVID-19 response. And now we can say that we have a COVID uh, budget and response plan as per now. I can just share a brief case study, an example of a child that we are supporting in this time, of a child uh, named Novel, who is nine years old, who was initially living with the dad, but unfortunately the dad uh, passed on. Uh, this year, uh, May, and uh, Novel was made uh, to stay with the uncle, who was uh, who voluntarily accepted to stay with him. But as Tushinda, we saw that he was not in capacity to stay or even care enough for the boy. So we did family tracing and we managed to get Novel's grandmother. And we are now engaging with the children protection officers and also the local government agencies to advise us on how we are going to make it legally for the grandmother to officially stay with the child. This is one of the cases that we are working with and I believe many organizations are working with such similar cases and we are grateful that we have donors and we have people standing by to support us where necessary and give us uh, intervention on how to work with difficult cases as per now that more we are getting challenges as many other organizations are facing during this crisis. So that is the update that I had, just to update you from what I updated you previously. And we still continue to have this family in this time of crisis. And I can say that the work is good. Thank you for that update, Kellen. I think that will bring us to our uh, Q&A session. Uh, there's one open question still from Feroz Zawani. How do you evaluate the trainings and other skills provided to caregivers and how do we ensure that it is reaching to the children in the CCI? Okay, so thank you for the question. I will start by the first part, how we evaluate our training. If you are talking about the online training that we've done specifically for COVID, we always have our pre-post evaluation that from this form we, we can tackle if all the knowledge is required from participants. And also we have an evaluation form that we usually ask the participant to fill after every training as well as we have the feedback that we take it directly from the participant. This is for both for online and for the face-to-face -face training. As for the second part of the question, it is related to how do we ensure that it is reaching to the children. Mainly, as, as, we, as we say, the caregiver support intervention is the ultimate goal is to improve the mental health of children. But at the first stage, we need to ensure that the information and the skills are acquired or are reaching the caregivers. I will talk now uh, regarding the online or the adapted version of CSI since it is our main focus in this webinar. We try to make it as simple as possible. So in every WhatsApp group, we have the list of attendees. So we have the list of caregivers. We ask the caregivers to rate every recording. We have a scoring, we have a rating, going from one to five, from not liking at all to liking a lot. And after the scoring of every audio, we have a set of questions that we ask the caregivers. It, they are, these questions are mainly about knowing if they're using the information, if the information are useful, if they were able to adopt all the techniques that we are talking about, if they're able to practice the relaxation exercise. Uh, mainly during the COVID response, we tried as much as we can 
not to overwhelm caregivers with, with the questions. Mainly, these are the questions that we, we were focusing on in order to understand uh, better how they are implementing. At the end of the cycle, we have a question that we asked the caregivers if, they, if these techniques were helping them in dealing better with their children. So from this, from this question, we can understand better how was the impact of the adapted version of CSI on the children. Thank you for that answer. Here's one for Kellen from Ilham Abu Mushbe. What are the ingredients of the food packages and according to which standards were followed while, while I think, uh, collecting them? We provide food package in regards to the number of individuals living in a house. So the standard is uh, we provide a um, balanced diet. Mostly we do dry uh, food. These are grains. We do uh, milk uh, just to ensure that we are not providing one item and then they're going to lack, look for another item somewhere else. So the package is well met as we provide the ballast diet necessary in comparison to the number of individuals living in a certain family. Thank you for that answer, Kellen. There is a question from Sana for Fadila and Mariana. Most of the time of day, parents are away at work. How do we connect with them in such situation? What do we do if they don't have an Android phone and are not literate? So, let me clarify something. I'm talking about our response in COVID, and when we've done the adaptation in Lebanon, everyone was in lockdown. So mainly most of the parents were at home, or at least most of their time were at home. In all cases, we were having flexibility. So the audios were sent, and the caregiver has the chance to listen to this audio whenever he wants, he will get back with a feedback also whenever he wants. So we have a specified date for sending the audios, we have specified dates for, uh, for having feedbacks, but there is flexibility. This is the first part of the question. As for the second part, yes, a big part of caregivers that do not have Android phone, this is why we've done a mapping on which caregivers do have and which does not have. And at some, in some project, we've provided the caregivers with MP4 where we've downloaded all the materials. And then we were going uh, with them week by week in order to support them which audio they need to listen to. Thanks, uh, Mariana. If maybe both Sarah and Mariana and Fadila could maybe indicate a bit on the possibility to uh, share the materials. Maybe Sarah, you can go first because there's some question about more stress busters materials. And I saw that you already shared one link uh, for the, the heart program, but is there any more stress busters materials that you can share or should we redirect to the link you shared before? So the link that we shared is a Save the Children online resource center that has uh, multiple copies of the Stress Busters pamphlet in, I believe, six or seven different languages. We will have more languages added in the next two weeks. So if there's a language that you are looking for that is not currently there, please check back. We should be adding French and several other languages in the next uh, one to three weeks. Um, Mariana and Fadila, there are several questions about the caregiver support interventions, about the recordings and the materials, whether that can be shared or not. Actually, uh, Eva, I'll talk ab first about the recordings. The recordings are in Arabic. It would be a pleasure if it can be used so we can share the recordings. As for the caregiver support uh, intervention manual, the manual itself, since, uh, as you know, Eva, we're at the end of the RCT, some, cha some changes will be, will be made on the intervention uh, itself. So once the changes are done, we can start sharing the manual. For the moment, we cannot share it. Once done, yes, we can. However, the recordings, yes, we can do. Great, thanks for that uh, answer. And to add to that, indeed, 
as soon as the materials are, when all the tests have been done, the research has been conducted, then afterwards it will be uh, made available. And then for sure, when we're also updating the Family Strengthening Task Force, mapping of tools and the caregiver support intervention will definitely also be placed on that overview as soon as it's open to use for, for all. I see one other question. Do you have any sources available to support the families in crisis situation of COVID-19? I know that Child Protection Alliance has a really great overview with all kinds of materials and interventions and materials to support children and families during COVID-19. That's an open source website, so it might be very interesting to look at that website as well for additional resources. But that's a very valuable uh, website. It's a live website so to speak so it's updated frequently there is a question from Matsue Suzuki to all presenters comparing your experience before and during COVID are you able to reach out to all those receiving your support now that in-person visits and checkups are not possible are you able to account for everyone on phone and whatsapp or these follow-ups uh, are an added challenge to your program so uh when the lockdown first started, we really had a fear from not reaching everyone. However, when we have checked with, uh, with all of them first by the needs assessment on the modality that they prefer to do so, we were really able to specify for each group the best modality and what suits them better. This is why mainly, yes, we were able indeed to reach all the persons that we were supporting. Uh, of course, we were dealing with challenges. For example, here, if I'm talking in, in Lebanon, some of the people were changing locations, they're changing for numbers. So I'm talking about these kinds of drop, uh, dropouts. But as for the people who, who stayed in the, in the same location, yes, we were able to, uh, to reach them. As I mentioned, it's not only about WhatsApp messages, it's about sometimes we were able to go in a very restricted visit to the field in order to provide SS kits, in order to provide hygiene kits, and by, by this modality, we were able also to, to check on them. So yes, we were able to do so. My guess is that uh, my answer is going to be similar to, to both uh, the experience of War Child Holland and Tushinda. And I know that we discussed this on the last webinar with the, with the Tushinda example. I think it's a challenge on both sides. It's a challenge to continue to follow up in the way that we were before COVID, obviously because of a lot of the changes in the logistics of who we're able to access, how we're able to access them or not. It's also a challenge in terms of how we are able to refer children and families and caregivers to services that in some cases are closed or have restricted hours, or even if those services are still available, the transportation links to those services are reduced or inaccessible. In a lot of cases, I, I think we're relying on, on a multitude of adaptations, including contacting families, staying in touch with families over phone, over WhatsApp, uh, over other technology platforms, as well as continuing to advocate and support community-based social workers, community-based healthcare workers, and others who provide direct support to children and families in the home to be categorized as essential workers and therefore have both their access, their transportation, and um, their resources sustained throughout the COVID-19 response uh, and lockdown restrictions. Obviously, it's an ongoing challenge to be able to reach everyone that we were reaching before. There is also obviously a challenge of a lot more families becoming increasingly vulnerable and needing services and support that were not in need of services and support before COVID-19. So I think we're continuing to adapt to those challenges as, as they grow and, and evolve. Thank you. Just like any organization, we are facing the same the similar challenges that they're facing. Uh, right now, we are not doing physical checkups like we used to. And uh, we are getting uh, challenges like uh, most of the offices, especially the child protection offices, they are closed. Uh, so we have to go through the uh, longer process for the child maybe rights to be protected or an intervention to be done. 
So with us, what we are doing, because now we are, we are not doing physical checkups, as a so social workers, we are asking to speak to the children directly, just to hear uh, from their sides. And we are, these uh, regular phone check-ins are done on a weekly basis. An example, I have a certain number of beneficiaries that I have to follow up through the week. And these I have to update weekly. If I'm getting any challenges, then I work together with the team just to come with uh, relevant interventions, because right now it's a challenge to work compared to the previous setup. Children, they're not going to school, so we try to uh, educate them, to inform them as to why they're supposed to be in school, especially right now that uh, we are going to see perpetrators trying to abuse children at this particular time. So that's why we are requesting, and also we are very keen in talking to them and listening to the end of the story or the challenges they're facing. Thank you. I hope that has answered uh, uh, the question a bit. So I would like to thank all the presenters for their preparation and their participatory sharing of information during this uh, webinar. And also I would like to say that this webinar was hosted well uh, by me and, and Sarah from the Family Strengthening Task Force of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. And I would like to thank you all for your participation and hope to see you uh, soon in the next webinar. So thank you again, everyone.